Good morning, and welcome to this live Bright Talk panel coming to you from Black Hat. Today's conversation this morning is going to be about IoT and the enterprise. And, you know, it's interesting timing for us because we've been talking about this for a while. We've had some internal discussions. And just within the last week, Microsoft has released a report that makes a claim that nation state actors have infiltrated 1,400 different organizations across every sector. And they did this using only three IoT devices, which are the most common ones, is VoIP phones, they used IP cameras, and actually video recorders. That's one that's kind of new to me. So we were having this discussion about, today we want to talk about what is the actual threat, how do we assess threats in enterprises, and what are some recommendations around that? Like, how do we solve for this? And what are the different things? And in light of the Microsoft report, it, it makes it very real from us, and it makes an excellent starting point. And to have this conversation with me today, I have three industry experts, uh, Jason, Todd, and Rudy. And I'd like them to take a moment and introduce yourself. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'm Jason Sirocco, CTO for, of IoT at Sictigo. Mm -hmm. uh, Todd Weber, I'm the CTO of Optive Security. I'll break the CTO trend here. Uh, I'm Rudolph Araujo. <laughs> I'm uh, the VP of Marketing at Awake Security. Great. So this Microsoft thing is interesting because the four of us, you know, we were having a discussion a week ago and we were talking about what are all these threats. Well, now we're living in a threat and they're issuing a note to 1,400 companies. Um, and Jason, I want to take this, start this off with you because I know with Sectigo, you guys think about identity. It, it turns out that a lot of these devices were compromised from either a default password or they just logged in. It wasn't very magical. Like, what's your thoughts around that? Exactly right. We're talking about, again, uh, such an old theme of weak forms of authentication, right? So in other words, forms of authentication that have been around 20, 30 years plus using your password, which as we know in the enterprise IT world, really should be deprecated. They'll be with us for a long time. Should never have carried over to devices, especially headless devices like mm -hmm. you just mentioned. Stronger forms of authentication exist, and especially for headless devices that don't have a Username and password that they're going to be typing in. Uh, in addition, as well, part of that part of the report that I've been reading is about uh, firmware changes. So, in other words, not mm -hmm. just the integrity of the identity of the device needs to be protected, but also the integrity of the actual firmware that's running on the device as well. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a perfect timing for that for that attack to come up for this talk. And Todd, you know, at, at Optive, you guys, well, you touch everyone. It's like. <laughs> How, how regular? Is this, a, is this a regular problem you guys are seeing? It's a ubiquitous problem. I, I can't think of a company or enterprise out there, and uh, you know, for that matter, a residential household that doesn't have these, this kind of issue. Uh, and you know, the ubiquitous of the problem will actually probably try to help us solve it, in that uh, everybody has this issue, everybody has to look into these issues, and everybody has to at least assess where they are on this and, like, and look at their attack uh, vector, or sorry, attack uh, surface of where, you know, these attacks could come from. Most of them are trying to do, uh, you know, using it as a relay uh, vector, you know, mm -hmm. what can I do, you know, I can't do much with a camera, but what can I get to from that camera? Yeah, you know what, that's, that's actually a really important point, too, that the idea here wasn't to compromise the device, it's the intrusion, which, uh, Rudy, you, you guys, I know you spend a lot of time looking at incident response. Where are they going? What are they trying to do here? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that that's kind of the interesting story here, right? Is, you know, I think a lot of the IoT security focus has been on securing the device itself and, and securing industrial IoT and things like that. And not that those things aren't important, but this is a great example, and this is primarily what we've seen, right? Where, to Todd's point, these devices get used as a very easy piggyback into the rest of the organization because, frankly, they're not on the radar of a lot of security teams, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, security teams, you tend to focus on kind of the known attack surface. You're not thinking about the polycom phone that's in the conference room. You're not thinking about the security camera. And, you know, unfortunately, I mean, maybe this is the wake-up call we, we all needed, right? I think the other thing that, you know, is reading that report that occurred to me, it probably wouldn't have taken a very sophisticated, you know, in this case, it was supposedly a nation state, but you know, given the, the dynamics of this particular threat, I don't think it takes a very sophisticated threat actor, and that's maybe the scariest part about it. Right? Admin, admin isn't really Yeah, exactly. Admin, so. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you can get the answer in a Google search, right? <laughs> so you bring up an interesting point about most security teams do not even consider IoT devices. So where do those persist in the network? How are they handling that? I'll leave that open to... Well, they definitely not seem to, to be taking a lot of the advice that's come out of uh, everywhere, which mm -hmm. is network segmentation. Uh, the, such flat networks. We're if we're talking about 
IoT in the enterprise, enterprises already have fairly flat networks, which is a problem, as we know. You're starting adding, adding IoT to that, the ability to pivot, as you say, from those devices into other things, it's uh, pretty easy. So therefore, operational technologies, IoT devices, uh, the ability to actually segment that, those technologies are around, they're just not being used. Well, segmentation is certainly a valid way to, the, you know, for people to address or uh, not just through segmentation, but also implementing things like zero trust functions mm -hmm. uh, with authentication mechanisms and that defines their, their access privileges. And, but also, you know, uh, just being able to understand what is your attack surface. And, you know, as, as Rudy was mentioning, uh, you know, I mean, when is IT security involved in like buying thermostats? Yeah, right. uh, they're, they're not. And, you know, they, uh, so, it, you know, many times security doesn't know that they're there. They don't get any input as, into where they go or how they get any, uh, access to the network. And those are the kinds of things that need to change as well as, you know, backing into the supply chain of what kinds of things are we buying? How do we tell the procurement people that, you know, uh, devices, you know, that are by and large very cheap devices in many cases, but how do they get, uh, you know, at least some rudimentary form of security validation uh, at a manufacturer level as before they get onto our networks. So that brings up an interesting point about assessment and who's to blame. Like, so, you're right, so it's a purchasing thing. Like, who, first of all, who is bringing in devices? And how are they deciding that these are acceptable devices? And then who's telling security later? Like, like, where does that blame fall? Like, like, how do you do that? I don't know if there's blame to put around. I mean, you know, people like, you know, they need thermostats, they need building, you know, HVAC systems. and. Uh, these things have been known to be more efficient uh, or, you know, either through operation or through support mechanisms if they're connected to a network and if they're connected to the Internet. Uh, you know, I'm not even sure, I, you know, I haven't really read an RFP coming out of a real estate service thing, but my guess is, you know, there's, there's usually requirements that it has some level of optimization and some level of remote uh, uh, telemetry functions. But, uh, you know, the, just the aspect of security rarely ever gets into that mindset because it's not a traditional IT asset. Right. It's not a traditional thing that you would apply those. Uh, uh, sorry, I was gonna say, like, go I, I think part of the challenge is we don't even think about these as traditional computing devices, right? Which they very much are. I mean, like, even if you think about something like a Raspberry Pi that's plugged under a desk, like, you know, this doesn't even have to be, you know, a, a thermostat necessarily, right? And, and, but these are all computing devices, which by definition mean, you know, they have access to the, to the network, they're, they're accessible, you know, to, to Jason's point from earlier, they're probably on the same segments. I mean, we've seen cases where, you know, we had a couple of exercycles that were internet connected sitting on the same segment as a bunch of SCADA devices, right? And again, I, th I think blame may be less and it might be more of an awareness thing mm -hmm. that, you know, something like this the report will hopefully help shed light, right? And, uh, and, and then security starts getting more involved, both from a procurement perspective, but also from a process perspective, right? Do we, do we know how to handle an incident that starts off with a, with, a, with, a, with a thermostat or a Raspberry Pi device? Because I think a lot of the skills and the tooling are still kind of getting developed. Which I would say most organizations would have no idea how to yeah. do a forensic analysis. But, but no, there, there is a, I think where it might go, if you guys may, might agree, is things like underwriter's laboratory, you're not gonna buy a light bulb without a UL on the side. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be equivalents to that down the road. But also, I think we are starting to see things such as the consortiums, mm -hmm. uh, Open Connectivity Foundation, right? If that's, if that's standards written on the side of the tin, uh, right. right, a procurement officer can say, hey, that's, that at least has some level of security and it's measurable. Right. right? So that, I think that's where it could start. And I think that's a necessary function. I don't know if necessarily legislation has to occur to do it, but, uh, if legislation is a you know jump point to get to there, then that, that's probably what needs to happen. But you know, us as security practitioners, I mean, we have to go teach procurement officers how to go look at these things right. because there is really no reference. I mean, there there's several reference architectures out there, mm -hmm. but none of which are universally adapted or universally known. And uh, you know, also it differs by country as well. And we and so far we're only talking about the easy stuff. We haven't right. even talked about the biomed and the industrial control side, where it's like where life you know is is a you know approximate problem. Right. I mean, you know, Todd, the point you made earlier is also interesting, right? The buyer here is not your traditional IT buyer, right? And, and the margins on these devices are so small that, you know, if you go into a procurement person and say, hey, that thermostat that was going to cost you, you know, $16 is now going to cost you 35 because we've got, had to add a bunch of security capabilities into it, it suddenly changes the dynamics of the market entirely, right? So, so it's not an easy problem that, you know, is going to get solved overnight, but, but I think awareness is the first, first step. Yeah, and the, the good news is there are solutions, you know, with authentication mechanisms that uh, companies like you are doing, but also 
you know, on the, on the front end, on the man, manufacturer side, there are companies like Vidu that do actually a, a front end kind of analysis on these firmwares. Mm -hmm. And where they look for particular things like default pa uh, admin passwords, they'll look for particular back doors in the firmware. Like, you know, was it, was it built in to do some VPN? As long as you put in this key, then you automatically, be, it happens. <laughs> They actually showed me like four or five of them, and uh, you know, surprises. it doesn't. And I mean, and the, you know, but uh, you know, and just doing that base level function, and to the integrity of the firmware itself, to put a hash value onto that, to where you can, you know, at least apply some level of before you actually buy. Now, the education process is we have to go, you know, educate our procurement people of like this is important to use as a standard because uh, you know, obviously, Vidu is not free, and why do why would manufacturers buy them? And then you know, you have the other side from the corporate side. There are security controls and, you know, there are security partners like Armis and you guys and you guys and, you know, several others, uh, uh, ORDR, uh, many others that uh, look at different components of IoT and they, they may look at different values, but I mean, looking, you know, at what we've talked about, trying to de develop that attack surface, what is it, what is there, what is it vulnerable to, and how do we go remediate it? So you bring up an interesting point, though, so and this kind of falls a bit into the consumer space as well, that... IoT devices are an assembly of parts from different manufacturers that get put together into a manufacturing process. And that could be anything from industrial devices to consumer devices. That you have firmwares, you mentioned something about firmwares earlier. Um, it sounds noble and good to say the manufacturer is going to start building more secure devices, but how do we ensure that happens beyond just the ratings? Like, how is it that when you buy a Samsung TV that every component in it was out of date on top of the TV software itself? And how do you ensure that whole supply chain? Like, how, how do we address that? I think uh, one of the ways that I'm seeing it within customers right now is there seems to s start being at the OEM level an awareness that sometimes earlier in the supply chain from the chipsets, the chipsets that are actually being employed are actually not as constrained as they thought. And as time goes on, not necessarily with Brownfield, but with Greenfield devices that we're seeing built, more and more things are coming out with secure elements and things that I can actually have a unique identity with an asymmetric certificate that actually can hold identity within that device. Now, unfortunately, there's probably all kinds of devices sitting out in the world right now that actually have those technologies within. They're just not being Some taken day, advantage right. of, right? So therefore, you know, for the extremely constrained tiny sensors, or as you said, in the consumer space where that extra one cent for a certificate might be too much, that's a different story. But at the controller level, right, for the right. verticals you were talking about, automotive, medical, et cetera, uh, industrial control, those devices that are being built right now, actually from the earlier part in the supply chain, do have those capabilities. It's not even about adding in cost, it's about knowing that it's there and taking advantage of it. I mean, you know, I think the other thing that maybe gives me a little bit of hope, right, is if you go back 15 or 20 years and think about the state of web application security, right, mm -hmm. you know, big popular websites had cross-site scripting and SQL injection and things like that. Still <laughs> but it's gotten better, right? Oh, no, it's all gone away, right? <laughs> but I, I mean, the point I was, I was going to make is like OWASP, you know, as an organization kind of yeah. came together. And, and really kind of helped, I think, elevate. And again, look, it's not perfect. I mean, it's not to say that no, every website doesn't have these vulnerabilities. But, I, you know, it's going to take some level of community effort to kind of define these standards, you know, ensure that uh, suppliers, ensure the procurement folks, uh, you know, everyone involved in that puzzle kind of understands what it, what it takes to build one of these devices, right? And, and, and you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get there sooner than 15 or 20 years. But, but uh you know, I, I think something around that should should help as well. well the yeah. awareness factor, is, as we mentioned, is is you know the first step, which I think we're getting towards a full awareness of well, I say full aware, at least a partial awareness of of the main problem, is that you know there are so many devices that, and like we mentioned before, there's no company that doesn't have this problem. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, so you'll we'll, we'll just have to, you know, what applies value. I mean, it's very interesting you talk about that the you know. They've actually, in many cases, taken the wafer space to actually put on security control features because that's usually the main question of right. like, mm -hmm. you know, how much wafer space can I take to add security features, which for the most part, you know, from 15 years ago had no value. Um, right. But now we have to apply a value to that and how much are customers willing to pay additional uh, for that valuation. So into these questions, I don't think we're going to get through this panel without asking this question. Uh, this comes from the audience. Where does blockchain fit into IoT? And how much does it cost per device? Let's go there. <laughs> Let's go there, guys.
<laughs> you know, I, well, uh, you know, the one thing that, that you know, as we were talking about the, the supply chain for these devices, right? I mean, I, I'll say upfront, I'm not a blockchain expert, right? But, but I know that blockchain does have a lot of applications when mm -hmm. it comes to ensuring the integrity of the supply chain. And when you talk about firmware and things like that, I think that might be an opportunity uh, to leverage these things. Because again, these are not monolithic devices, right? I mean, like you look at the thermostat, there's probably hundreds of components in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, so, so that's, because if you think about it, if, if I'm a nation state or if I'm looking to compromise an organization, you know, trying to find rootkit kernel malware is probably not worth my time anymore when I can come in through the TVs that uh, you, know, you have in every conference room or the polycoms or the, or the thermostats, right? So, so I think uh, that's potentially an application of blockchain, but- I would say that I would agree with you on the immutable ledger kind of right. function that it's, you know, you can't, it can't be changed and to understand, okay, this was you know, configured in this way and this is the, uh, the valid image and then moving along as a back-end like encryption technology or as a back-end uh, yeah. authentication mechanism, I got to tell you right now, I think there are better ways to accomplish that. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in your, uh, but I mean, you know, we've seen lots of companies that come out to, I think, just to say the word blockchain somewhere in their, in their features. I'm pretty sure you get another five or 10% from investors by saying. <laughs> <laughs> as, long as, as long as ML and AI is That's in there correct. too. That's right. Now I think blo blockchain has some killer apps. Uh, it's just, it's not as much as people might think. Right. I think you have to ask the question first, uh, is a database, is a central database just better than, than a blockchain? If, that the answer is, if the answer to that is yes, then just go with your regular database that's protected. Uh, blockchain is ideal for distributed situations. Mm -hmm. So in other words, think of medical, where medical records uh, that are, you know, data that's being spit out by devices needs to be seen by multiple public third parties. And the absolute need for that to be distributed and not centralized is important. Maybe blockchain has a place there, maybe. But I think in most cases, a data, you know, a traditional database of some kind could probably suffice. Yeah, I mean, you know, Jason, you, you make a good point, which is, you know, it's not just the security of the device, but it's also what that device then produces or impacts, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, medical devices hopefully have a higher standard of security, I would hope, than... They you don't. Know, <laughs> no, I, 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 we should Chris, aspire. Chris said it for us, so <laughs> have to say we, it. We, we should aspire for, uh, right? So, so, so that's another aspect of this, this thread landscape that I think, you know, is worth maybe talking about and, and thinking about, right? Because it's not just that device, but it's like, what kind of data does that device have access to? Mm -hmm. um, well, and you bring up another interesting complication is that, you know, with biomed devices, normally, you know, IT security people aren't allowed to touch those devices. They're by regulatory between They're them. not even allowed to patch those devices. Right. Exactly. They're I mean, those have to go back the setting. to setting. They have to be to the manufacturer and the mm -hmm. And I mean, this is, there's very valid reasons for what they're doing. Uh, but the same occurs in, you know, industrial control. The same yep. is uh, true for like, uh, we're here in Las Vegas. so the IP slot side of uh, the gaming networks. Uh, strangely, they don't let hackers on that part of the network. I don't know why. Um, but, you know, those have to be, you know, done by certified gaming technicians who don't necessarily have the, you know, uh, IT security background to understand what they're, you know, maybe uh, exposing uh, these assets to. So you guys are actually bringing it, I, I think the next place we need to go here, going back to the Microsoft thing. So they just told 1,400 companies that they're potentially compromised by their IoT. We're getting into some practical assessment here. Like, so what would you recommend these companies do? Like, okay, somebody's told them you might have a problem. What now? Well, as, as you were mentioning before, it's like, the, you know, this is not a greenfield environment. Right. This is, you know, and this is just the stuff they know about. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, they'll have to uh, put in, you know, so, so first of all, just the base stuff. You have to understand what is out there. And that's, that's where you first have to do it, um, you know, and then assess what, uh, once you get comfortable that I've captured maybe not all, but at least 90 some percent of then, okay, what, what do we do with these? Uh, you know, are they running vulnerable to at least known vulnerable functions? Uh, you know, O'Day is going to be a different story and always will be. But uh, and then, you know, kind of go into the, uh, you know, are, are we doing authentication? You know, we're doing the basic things that are already, in, you know, innate or uh, into these product sets that just aren't happen to be turned on. Uh, and then the, you know, the incident response side of this, I mean, I, I rarely see companies that are qualified, and I, I mean, I, I don't mean this in any sort of, uh, you know, negative way, it's just mm -hmm. nobody teaches, like, how to go through yeah. a, a camera and like, oh, uh, there, there it is right there. Uh, there's, the, there's the bad piece of malware uh, mm -hmm. code, but, uh, you, you know, people are going to have to start learning those things as they mature 
down into uh, their pr security programs, which you know I would say is going to be a shift for most of them as they mature. Most of them are looking to mature in different ways, and they're going to have to retrofit uh, IoT into their uh, plans. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the other part of this is this is not an IoT exclusive problem, right? I think what the Microsoft report also showed is this is a blended threat landscape problem where, or, or threat surface, uh, attack surface problem, right? Where these these IoT devices fit, you know, kind of nicely, so to speak, within the rest of the IT environment. So I think trying to figure out, okay, you know, if you see kind of lateral movement, what does lateral movement look like when, mm -hmm. when it's an IoT device hitting, you know, because maybe the traditional ways of, of we've thought about lateral movement or credential abuse and things like that don't really fit, right? So, so is there a role for like the MITRE attack framework here to maybe evolve to think about, you know, a new set of threats? Uh, you know, legislation has come up a couple of times, you know, as, as you guys know, NIST just put out some guidelines, uh, actually this this week, I think. Um, and the good news is it's open for comments till September. So, you know, this is again, like a call to action, I think for all of us in the community to, uh, to try and, you know, influence that, right? I mean, uh, because I think ultimately that's what's going to help, you know, companies that don't have, you know, the Uber level of, of security mm -hmm. maturity to say, okay, you know, what's at least the top five things I need to do to protect uh, my organization? Mention uh, the, the NIST guidance, uh, which of course is you know not prescriptive, but it at least has some good stuff in there. One of the things it's calling for is uh, automated configuration management. So in other words, Microsoft or others, somebody who's the vendor of that device might be able to give a, a cheat sheet on how to reconfigure that device, right. even without physically changing it, it's, mm -hmm. because it's brownfield, as you say. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's a configuration to take admin, admin, and change it to something else, maybe. So what about, but what about the companies that are already compromised? Uh, Rudy, you kind of went down a good dread there that if somebody's compromised their IoT devices already, they need to start looking bigger, right? You've got to start seeing what else it's been talking to. Right. And I think almost uh, for the most part, most people have to assume that they've been compromised at some level. Uh, you know, it could be, you know, minor levels, but, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they'll, but they'll have to apply different models, uh, meaning like nobody really knows, you know, the, uh, or at least not many people know, how, you know, for your company, Chris, uh, in Vector, mm -hmm. like, you know, how many controllers does a normal camera speak to? Should it only communicate with one and then one patch update server? And That's a good to, question. To, to look at those kind of like, what are, the, what are supposed to be the traffic flows? Mm -hmm. The good news is, is these are very static in IoT right. environments. So, uh, you know, being able to find anomalies should be should actually be connected to Twitter. But, you know, that, that's where people are going to have to start applying. At least that's, you know, I mean, beyond that attack surface validation and then the vulnerability. And I love the configuration management because patch mm -hmm. management isn't always the solution. Segmentation isn't always uh, the solution. Uh, and, you know, configuration management is a huge one as well. If you read down far enough in NIST, it's calling for exactly what you just said, which is if the device can't log, you're, you're perhaps in a lot of trouble, especially from a, a retroactive standpoint. So you right? have no evidence. Exactly. So therefore, one of the things NIST is calling for is make sure that device can do some form of logging right. so that if it is connecting off to Twitter or doing something that isn't standard, at least you have some idea. Yeah. You've got to put a syslog client on things now. Yeah. You know, you know I think the, the other maybe positive here is, you know, this, you know, we'll, we'll throw in another buzzword here, right? But what this is also coming at the same time is the kind of the, you know, the cloud, you know, prevalence, right? Because well, I mean, to that point, cloud and IoT are almost synonymous at this point because you had a bunch of devices speaking to the cloud. Right. And, and, and I think that's where the, the likes of Microsoft probably have a role to play, right? I mean, Microsoft, for instance, offers a, an IoT backend. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, obviously they, they are likely to have far more of a sophisticated security program than the average maker of the IoT device. So, you know, can we build more security into the platform, so to speak, right? So, so that's another, like, especially when it comes to things like logging, there's going to be a limited amount of logging you can do on the actual device, right? Just form factor. Uh, you know, cost, et cetera. But, but I think as, as these platforms start, kind of start to evolve, you know, I think there's going to be more onus on the, on the platform, kind of the back end side of this to, to, to build in a lot of these security capabilities as well. You know, it's not going to fix every problem in terms of segmentation and things like that. There's, mm -hmm. you know, that's not to say the onus is completely off the, 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 the company that's deploying these, but, uh, you know, that, that might help. I also see an opportunity for uh, newer companies to come out and do central management of IoT functions. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and how to plug into what's available from a configuration management or what, uh, or vulnerability management, and whether or not they follow the MUD standard or um, uh, what's the IETF one the, for update? Uh, it's called like standard update. Uh, 
you know, th there are standards for these kinds of things, right. but then how you centrally manage those functions, because I mean, you know, we're talking in some cases tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices in each enterprise. And you know, okay, you get it to where you want, but there are 100,000 and tomorrow there's 100,000 and one. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do you apply, you know, an operational component after you actually get some controls in place? Well, it's the art of authorization, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So how does that work though, when you guys mentioned earlier that a lot of these devices can't even be touched by the company and they're owned by the vendors. And healthcare, I know that's a big thing. Like there's a manufacturer, they, the device gets purchased by a doctor or somebody like that, they're put in. There's an IT security team in the hospital, but the manufacturer owns the cloud and the device and the updates. Like, But I mean, there are other ways to you know mitigate that. I mean, you know, you can't touch the device, but you can mitigate what the device is speaking to. Now, granted, in a, you know, where human life is at stake, you want to be pretty careful about what sure. you're doing there. But, uh, you know, and just the awareness that, uh, you know, A, that device is there, B, this is what that device does, and it's configured in this way, and it's communicating to these other components. And just understanding that, I think, is a step forward for many of us. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Todd, something you said earlier, right, like, the, the, again, the good news is these devices tend to have very static, you know, behavioral patterns, right? And, you know, I was kind of half joking about the Twitter, right, but, you know, <laughs> If, if they do start communicating to a place that they've never communicated before, or they don't communicate relative to their peer group, right? Because all of the polycoms or all of the thermostats should have, again, very, very similar behavioral pattern. And so, so I think there's, there's opportunities to apply, you know, data science and, and, and te techniques like that to kind of identify these, these malicious uh, or potentially compromised devices, uh, especially when they start hitting your IT resources, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because again, you know, no reason maybe that a, a you know a, you know one of your IoT devices should be logging into your SQL Server, uh, right? Or even trying to establish communication. Right. Users. Exactly. And the, those will be great uh, things to do. But I mean, establish those baseline criteria, and there are several companies out there that uh, will help you do this. Yeah. So that becomes interesting that you say that. So companies help you do it because the one thing that I know people also struggle with is is talent let's call it the time and talent problem like you, we got people that are overworked overloaded um there's all these nice ideas we always have in security that never get done because no one's paying attention to them doing it so how do we scale that especially at the scale that iot is going to be well that's and that's what i was just mentioning is eventually we i mean the, after you establish that baseline function you will have to fit this into your normal security operations which you know the regular things apply to a talent shortage, so you're going to have to do things like, you know, automation. How does automation fit in? Mm -hmm. How does central management fit in? Because that's the only way you're ever going to get any sort of nominal control over the environment is to have those levels of components and that uh, input into security operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, again, like, think of, you know, people think patch management is the problem today, right? Imagine if you've got a million devices to patch, yeah. uh, you know, because there's some new vulnerability that got just announced. I, I think, you know, there's going to be some level of paradigm shift here, right? I mean, maybe we move into a model where it, it, it's a much more of a kind of a, how quickly can you detect and respond to something? Because maybe you can't prevent everything every single time. Um, and, and I think, again, I think the onus is, you know, on, on us as a community of, of, of security professionals to kind of help define that standard and, and drive that forward because some of the stuff will just translate as is, but like, you know, mm -hmm. things like incident response, like you were saying earlier, Todd, I mean, you know, it's not going to be the same, you know, like can you pull logs off of every device? Not going to be the same thing, so. Okay. Can I look at the registry? No, right. No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> within the, within the, o, the supply chain uh, from the chipset manufacturers down to the, the OEMs, in other words, just before the consumer, mm -hmm. even those companies really need to partner up with security companies. Yeah. Those people have 10 engineers and 100 problems, and therefore solving the toughest security problems are, is maybe not something they really should be doing uh, by themselves. The thing is, though, uh, I think by the time it gets to the consumer, by the time it becomes a report like we just read, mm -hmm. it's, it's a head scratcher where almost all of a sudden incident response becomes really, really important. But Goodness, I think in the in the in the greenfield part of it, more more needs to be done. Putting out devices with admin admin is that, right. that's got to stop. And I mean, I bring that up because to that point, the report when it says fourteen hundred companies were hit, you now have a trend and a pattern and a consistency of people ignoring devices, like universally. That's not like a one off. And plus, they just we, we just gave a recipe book too. <laughs> so, yeah, basically. Like, okay, let's you know. I wasn't looking at it today, but I am tomorrow about like who's got admin admin out there. Yeah. The thing is, though, within that supply chain, for example, even if you were to go up to 
a, a level of authentication that is uh, prescribed by something like NIST or, some, or one of the consortiums. The thing is, you still have issues to deal with, right? So in other words, the cryptographic algorithm that the certificate might be using might be fine today. Yeah. But in 10 years, you know, if this, if this is a device, this might last 10, 15, 20 years, uh -huh. yeah. where, which is where post-quantum, you know, starts to edge in. Uh, again, I, th I think... Which is on the horizon line It's now, so. It's something we absolutely have to be watching. You know, it's not going to bite us tomorrow, but it's, it is going to bite us. But I think, you know, just uh, baby steps is like at least take Des out of the mix. <laughs> right, right. Because you know, that's step probably down. resident on, you know, the, on the native uh, components. That's probably all that's there is like, you know, a, a very limited form of encryption, uh, you know. And, uh, but to your point is like, you know, when uh, things like OpenSSL, you know, and, you know, so I remember when, you know, OpenSSL had a vulnerability and everybody was like, I don't even know where <laughs> all my OpenSSL versions are. But those are the types of things you know, as you put into SecOps from a, CM, uh, from a CMDB stuff uh, component, as well as a uh, uh, landscape, uh, you know, threat landscape component, is to understand where all those are. And, how, you know, I mean, you can get to the how as well, but uh, just understanding where they are and that how many of you have of them is, is a good step. But to your point about cryptographic, I mean, you know, from a manufacturing standpoint, I don't necessarily know how to tell the manufacturers to put, you know, quantum computing into, you know, their, <laughs> their little minor chipsets that, you know, cost like four cents. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I mean, that's you know, a difficult one. I, I'd rather just take yeah, one little right. baby step first. You know, I, talking of baby steps, right, I mean, California passed legislation that requires the passwords to be changeable and, you know, not, 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 not be default. I mean, I think I, I completely agree with you, right? I think, I think there's things that we can do that kind of help move the ball forward. Um, you know, I also think one of the, you know, I was talking to one of our customers and he said, look, one of the challenges we have is you can buy these devices. Let's say you buy, you know, 50 of them they could be like six different variants yeah. just within that one box, mm -hmm. right? Even though they're all functionally doing the same thing because again, the, the, the supply chain for these things is so complex, right? And so, so as he, he's thinking about patching and he's thinking about how to kind of manage this from a configuration perspective, you know, it's not just one device, it's, it's, it's a plethora of devices. And then you multiply that by all of the different other types of devices in the organization. So yeah, this, this is, it's a complex problem, right? Luckily they have the four of us to figure it out. But you know, <laughs> you know it's you know what's not in that California legislation, which I find interesting, is there's no uh, prescription for uh, encryption of the wire. So in other words, even if you did put in some form of authentication more than just that username and password, you put in a symmetric token, for example. Right. A symmetric token is going to be passed in the clear. Yeah. Therefore, <laughs> what have you done? Therefore, the NIST guidance and, and even the federal legislation that's been proposed does have that. But some baby steps might be too small of a step. And I think California legislation is an example of that. That's something to be aware of. I haven't read the California legislation. That's interesting it's stuff. It's fairly new, and uh, they're adopting, they're trying to adopt a lot of things from GDPR and things like that in California, as it tends to do. So all the other states will be looking at it. That's a really interesting point, though, that you don't think it's going to be enough. So what is enough? Where does it got to go? What's the minimum viable security? Uh, I think where NIST is going, and where, even where the federal legislation, which I, I think uh, before we we yeah. talking today, you were saying, saying you know, the, the, the federal legislation just says do what NIST says, right? Uh, I think I think NIST is getting close to being the minimum baby step. So, so do you think NIST is like this becomes a broader topic now? NIST has been a framework and a guideline for a lot of companies. There is a segment that has to adhere to it, which is ITAR regulations, DFAR, government contractors. They have to completely adhere to it. Do you start to see that model moving into other manufacturers, like in order to do business? I would say just if saying? they if they have to do that for the federal government, they're not going to set up a separate production right. schedule for here's what we're selling to the federal government and here's what we're selling to everybody else. They're going to apply the same construct across their entire production line, and that's what the federal government, I believe, is hoping for. Right. Is that they'll be able to drive, you know, a further standard just by saying if the federal government buys it, then it has to follow these standards. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think look, you know, uh, the, the, that's exactly the point, right? I mean, the big buyers are going to be the people that influence it. You know, the DoD is a big buyer, right? And and you know, just like you know, if you look at standards for cars or things like that, safety standards, etc., they're all influenced by where the you know, the, not by you know the mom and pop shop that's buying the the individual things, but you know, hopefully, you know, that helps because I don't know if legislation will necessarily pass, right? I mean, we all know kind of the, the log jam that, that's in D.C. today. But, but I think the NIST uh, uh, guidelines are hopeful to me because just the, the buying power 
of the government and, and you know, eventually the large I think just the systems. attention to get to yeah, it uh, totally. has been helpful to, to push people in a direction, even though the legislation may not pass or it may take a long time for it to pass. Um, just the awareness of, you know, that NIST, uh, you know, has a responsibility here and NIST is actually trying to to uh, to write that response. And my, my, frankly, Microsoft using its uh, you know you know visibility to, to basically yeah. say you know this is a real problem. I think again you know like part of this is just awareness, right? I mean, and 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 that'll help I think also drive behaviors. Just one last word on it. I think federal does affect absolutely everything because they, they run hospitals, they run fleets of yeah. cars. Uh, there's all they, smart city, right? They, in Washington D.C. itself, there, there's not a single IoT vertical that they don't procure into. They, they will affect everything. Yeah. And, you know, my hope just as a personal consumer of everything is that, you know, I mean, you know, enterprises may be able to fix this, but what am I doing in my house? Right. So, I mean, you know, the further we can push this along, the better I feel as an individual, uh, uh, you know, because we all have, you know, we all have you know, the same problem in our homes. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. You know, at least we, we've moved away from the uh, era of having uh, routers that you'd buy at the store and they'd be, you know, admin, admin, right? So they, they've kind of moved that uh, along. So hopefully we can get some of the other consumer devices moving along as well. So, I mean, we, we talked. Check my Raspberry Pi. <laughs> I don't know if I turned it off. <laughs> so, you know, Maybe we, we talk about that. Obviously, that uh, primarily it is bad username and password. But as you say that, a lot of the Linksys routers were compromised. This is when we start getting into vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the password gets used because it was so obvious and easy. Yeah. We know attackers don't like to use advanced attacks unless they have to. Like, They'll go to simple every time. Right, yeah. zero days are a waste of time if you can just log in. Right. So once we get past the username and password, we start to think of other type of IoT hardware vulnerabilities, stuff like that. What do we start to look at? Well, there's, there's other vectors that we're not even really talking about yet. Yeah. Uh, if you think it, some of the things is Wi-Fi is not the only air that networks use. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Bluetooth, we have NFC. I mean, you have lots of other wireless technologies that are out there that most enterprises won't have scanners or any ability to even sense those networks exist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you, you think of what could possibly, you know, like I can go stand outside a window, you know, stand up a Bluetooth component and like see who attaches. Uh, uh, universal plug and play protocol yeah. have vulnerabilities. Uh, the most recent uh, Tesla ECU attack I saw, there was an open FTP port. Uh, <laughs> lots of ways in. FTP in your car? That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm sure that would get covered in the hacking village of the Democrats <laughs> this weekend. Yes. Let's give it to Valisek and Charlie. I'm sure they'll do it again. Absolutely. I'm sure they're already working on it. So let's kind of pivot this into the uh, prescriptive vendor space. Let's call it that. that so these attacks have happened, there's companies compromised, there's all these things that we'd like to see come down the pipeline, like better legislation. Let's all contribute to the guidelines of NIST trying to make recommendations on how these devices should be built. Let's start thinking about how we start to control these, but what can we as the security community provide companies like now and today immediately, or what are some things that we can start doing for them? I, I think, you know, a couple of things that come to mind, right? One is that discovery, visibility, uh, problem. I think being able to just know what you have and then be able to classify it, right? It's not just knowing that this is an IP address, but knowing that this is this model of a Honeywell thermostat or... or I think or, this or, version of firmware or that is possibly vulnerable to these four or five things. Right. And maybe even inputting threat intelligence, which are all available today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you take that threat intel to say, hey, there's a known, uh, not just is it vulnerable, there's a known exploit to this function mm -hmm. that is going around that, you know, hopefully Microsoft shares. And, uh, sure. you know, <laughs> then we can use it to the, those extents, those are all, you know, easily, I say easily, uh, they're available today. It's uh, possible, it's, it's possible. possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, the, and then the other side of this is, you got to assume that these are either compromised or likely to get compromised, so then what's the plan post that, right? You know, again, I think most organizations you walk into don't necessarily, you know, think about incident response even in general, right? I mean, every big breach you hear about, and you know, the, you, know you, you feel like people are running around after the fact, thinking, like, how, how do we deal with this, right? Now you throw an IoT into the mix, you know, all bets are off. So I'll be honest and say that's one of my genuine worst fears is to, if you make that assumption that, you know, at some level they've been compromised, uh, having to make a recommendation of throw all this away and go buy a brand net new and then apply your controls from there is, that's a very daunting thing to be able to do. But, uh, you know, in many cases, if you can't do this attribution level of, uh, is it, uh, how, you know, how, you know, to an incident response of how do we, 
how do we look for components and you know and not just the traffic side because it could be just you know staying dormant uh, you know uh, waiting to awake at a certain time mm -hmm. uh, but just not that understanding of uh, you know what could be compromised but I mean you know IOT devices have been out there now for a lot longer than the security controls have uh, you know been trying to control well, what happens when it's a million dollar robot in a manufacturing plant they've had for 10 years and somebody just plugged in? <laughs> I, it's interesting you mentioned that. It's, you know, I, I talked to a, you know, a, a client who had printing presses that were manufactured like in the early 1900s. And they've made <laughs> one change to them since the early 1900s, which was um, you know, changing it from physical tip, typeset to digital typeset. And that's it. And that was like in 1970 something. <laughs> and I mean, how do you go tell that guy yeah, you know, the, it, it, it might break it, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it, and his point to me was like, there are no spare parts for this thing. There are no, you know, there, there's no way to fix this. I mean, you know, he even told me that uh, the printing presses were too big to actually move in the building. So they built the building around the printing presses. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, I mean, you know, it, it's very hard to have that discussion with him about, yeah, you need to put in some security controls, but it's, it's very scary for many of these people who, uh, you know, their job is to keep those printing presses or, you know, uh, whatever the bi business process is, their job is to keep those things up and running. I gotta say though, one of the bright lights where we've seen some security being actually put in uh, or being thought about very hard is in the, at the consortium level. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is because there is commercial uh, needs to either interoperate securely, right? So this is why people come together in a consortium, or it's my brand reputation is so on the stake, or in the oil and gas industry, the, the risks are so great that I do have to get together with my competitors and figure this out. And so whenever we've seen that, regardless of the vertical, some really good thinking has actually been done. So therefore, yes, that is for Greenfield. It's not for, as, as, you, as you're talking about, the devices that are already put in. But for the device, devices of tomorrow, I think uh, the consortiums right now are, are leading the way. And in some verticals where they just can't get rid of the risk, they have to do it right. That's where we're seeing the real bright lights right now. And they're, those are the people who, you know, are going to have the knowledge of being able to mix, like, you know, the, the technology side with the business component of what they're trying to do. They're going to be in the best position to do that, yeah, uh, I mean, rather than me as a user. You know, I, I, I will say, you know, as of, uh, you know, just this week, you know, we've talked to a few, you know, medical device makers, for instance, and they actually view this as a business opportunity as well, right? Because it's a to way, differentiate. yeah, as a way to go to their clients and the hospital systems and the, the VA and places like that and say, like, look, you know, we're better than this other company because we've built security into the platform. Here's all of the options that you have, you know, once you, you go with us, whereas with this other vendor, you know, you don't get that. So, I, I you know, I think, again, you know, I, it, there's definitely an opportunity here. Again, for the stuff that's already deployed, harder problem to solve. Uh, but for, for the stuff that's still getting deployed or the newer stuff, you know, I, I think there's, there's, there's definitely- To your point though, don't let that get in the way of moving exactly. forward. You know, you, know exactly. you still have a problem, right. but still move forward. Yeah. We'll have to come up with a different solution to fix what's already there. Imagine, imagine a day when security isn't just considered a cost center, yeah. you know, as, as you're saying. I've, yeah, we've been saying that for <laughs> ever. It's 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 been a long time. Yeah, that's a long one. So I think uh, you know we're we're coming to the top of, of an hour here. So as we're running out of time, I, th I think I think as a takeaway from each of you, I want to hear like what is your one key takeaway around IoT? And what are your thoughts? Like like what do you want to leave the audience with? And let's start with you. Sure. Uh, back to the basics, especially in terms of anybody building devices today, really really think hard about modern forms of authentication for devices that are headless. Right? There, are, there are correct ways of doing this. There probably is something within your supply chain that will allow you to enable that for not a lot of extra cost, which is probably front of mind for people in that industry. Uh, for people who are purchasing in, within an enterprise, I think it came up here today. Procurement language. Uh, you know, it might not be as simple today to be able to say, well, here's the check boxes that I need to check. Those check boxes are coming. But in, in the meantime, procurement language for enterprises for IoT security is probably pretty important. I think that's that's it. Todd? I, I echo a lot of that. I mean, the, the first thing is that there are solutions to many of these problems, and you don't have to solve them all today. Uh, just take a leap forward to, to do the basics. I mean, and that's really all we owe our companies and our enterprises is to, we have to do our due diligence of care, what's within our control or what should be within our control and fix those things that we can. And then the second part is, is the education side to 
procurement and to the other business teams that you know have a stake in this, whether or not it's real estate or the biomed components or the plant managers. Uh, and you know, I mean, the plant managers have a little bit more going uh, because they've had to deal with it for a while longer. But uh, you know, for for the others, like especially real estate, I mean, hasn't been part of their normal every day. Or like, oh, are we doing this securely? And you know, those are the two takeaways I'm taking. Yeah, I think I think from my perspective, you know, coming at it from an enterprise IT perspective, it, it you know, it comes down to something that we've touched on multiple times, right? Which is knowing what you have and characterizing it, right? So, so you know, there's the old saying in security, right? If you don't even know it exists, you're not securing it. So, so I think to me, that's you know, that's just one of the big challenges that I think we've got to help customers and and and, and organizations solve. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, again, um, you know, my 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 bias to the to the response side of this, right? Like, how how are you going to plan for when the inevitable happens when you do get that call from Microsoft what do you do right mm -hmm. if you're a healthcare organization does that mean you you shut down the hospital for the next 3 days while you try and patch these devices mm -hmm. probably not right so so i think having that and 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 kind of you know doing your your tabletop exercises etc to to figure out what what you would do if you were in a situation like that is probably another part of the takeaway that's a good one too yeah, yeah and so you know with that and i think this has been a great conversation gentlemen i really appreciate it you know, just to add mine to it, to me the takeaway here is that do something now. Um, there are 1,400 companies at Microsoft labeled as one nation state that potentially compromised. I guarantee every company on the planet has a problem, especially with things like Shodan scanners and ways that people are looking for devices regularly, like I've admittedly done it myself. Like, you can just see what's out there. That um, today, at a minimum, everybody needs to go out there, look what they have. Just check the basics on it, as we said. And um, the problem's real, but it's achievable. I, th I think that's what we're hearing as well. It's just, just going to take some work. Yeah, right absolutely. Yeah. So with that, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate your time, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you as well. Thank, thank you. you.